One, two? Okay. Right. So, um, yes, I'm happy to be the last speaker. So I'm the one who prevents you now from going home or exploring further KL. Um, but I'm also very happy to be here. And um, as I just, just introduced, so uh, on the one hand side, yes, I'm running use. And I will tell a bit more about that as well uh, out of Singapore. Um, but I'm also the, the local chapter president of the Location-Based Marketing Association, um, which is a global association for um, advertisers uh, and, and platforms and businesses around location-based marketing and advertising solutions. Um, so we bring their different um, industry players um, together, um, create solutions, uh, and is a non-for-profit association um, run with a, a number of chapters globally. Uh, so I'm running the, that Singapore chapter with also an uh, Australian chapter. Um, I think Hong Kong is coming up. Um, so here in the region, um, the location-based marketing association is also um, getting more footprint, I would say. Um, myself, I'm, I'm German and living in Singapore since six years, so I've got some insight into the, the Asian region as well now. And uh, I would like in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes, share a bit about location-based advertising and also at the end show something how this can relate back to um, the local search and, and media business. Oops. But I'm, oops getting here acquainted with the mouse. Um, so let me start off with one video clip. Um, and maybe you re um, recall and see, um, remember that one. But um, let me show you first. So, I guess you've seen Minority Report, um, that was from Minority Report. This is 13 years ago, um, and that's all about this personalized advertising, was happening basically now. Technologies may be different, at this stage it was the iris recognition, what they um, imagined. Um, but it goes a bit further, if you watch that scene, he walks into a store, he gets personalized offers even when he walks into the fashion store. Uh, so it's really, on the one hand side it's a bit creepy, um, because it really goes into your personal space very, very much. Um, on the other hand, um, it's really leveraging the location and the context in, in real time to provide um, a very personalized um, experience to, uh, to him in the movie. So, now bring this uh, towards um, a bit mobile and, and the environment uh, here. <coughs> About screen time on mobile, I mean, I don't want to go too, too far and then too broad, but um, I just want to put up a little reminder on how much time we spend today on, on screens and how much time we spend on, on mobile. And uh, this is um, about seven hours and 20 minutes a day in Asia Pacific people spend on a, on a screen and mainly on a mobile screen. Um, this is a, a bit more um, than it is in, in the US, for example, or in, in global average. So here, Asia, Asia Pacific is definitely become a mobile first, uh, if not a mobile only environment. Um, so I really want to put up a little reminder on that. Um, but also, when you relate this to advertising and mobile, um, if you look at the um, uh, Americans, for example, about 52% of Americans interact with advertising on a mobile phone. Um, if you look in China, and we saw it before with the Wi-Fi, um, this goes up to 86% of Chinese consumers who interact with uh, mobile um, advertising. So there's a quite higher acceptance and interaction also with, uh, with advertising, and especially on mobile. But now, if you look at this, how advertisers respond, that looks usually more like this. So the, the advertisers' response up until now um, has not necessarily catched up with that. Um, if you look at uh, advertising revenues of on mobile and mobile devices, um, it's still on a very small base. Um, overall, uh, we speak on about 10% um, of advertising spending globally is, uh, is happening on a mobile device, um, which still comes to 60 to 70 billion US dollars um, globally uh, for this year. So it's 
um, transiting, um, but it's not been catching up uh, yet. And um, of course, I mean, those are very static billboards, um, but I think by, by bringing this up, I want to just say and share that um, eventually um, all types of different traditional advertising, the, the print, uh, what's today print, um, TV, um, radio, um, all will become a more and more digitized and interactive and more personalized um, environment. Um, now, looking at it a bit from, no, not so much from now the small, small, medium business, but more from the larger businesses, um, they start to move in this direction. Um, this, for example, is a campaign run in Moscow's airports, the three um, Moscow airports, um, where it was highly targeted to luxury shoppers uh, for Vertu, the luxury phone brand. Um, where the ad, because of the, the location targeting, so being shown only at the airport locations, uh, got an extreme high uh, click-through rate, um, which was like 17 times higher than, than the industry sta um, standard and average, um, which was also due to the fact that the quality of um, mobile ads, of the, the images and all that, um, has been improved quite significant um, over time and has been leveraged for that. Um, Givenchy, also more um, luxury brands, um, running ads, and you see here um, an animated GIF, so when you click on the banner, it goes up to a uh, landing page, which uh, indicated in this case to drive people into a mall um, where there was a pop-up store uh, to redeem for a free sample of uh, a new fragrance. Um, on that one, uh, that was run in a UAE, in Dubai Mall and uh, five other malls. Um, we got a 30% secondary action rate um, on that, so 30% of people who clicked on the banner um, went to the pop-up store and really redeemed that for the free uh, sample size. Um, so you could see that there's a quite high and measurable also then um, interaction and uh, closing the loop basically between the advertising and uh, the drive to store, or drive to location um, possible when the message is right, when the location is right. Um, and when uh, also, of course, the offer is, is an attractive one. Let me skip over this one. Um, Lenovo, also in, in Thailand, for example, running ads. So it's to show that, um, I mean, big advertisers are picking up on that. Um, but the big advertisers and the small ones, I think they produce all um, big data, and they both the data and the context is what uh, really makes it. And I think there, um, I would like to give two examples how that is, is relevant and what's, uh, what I mean with this. Um, context can be not only location, but can also be the weather at a current location. So in this case, this was run by a DAF in uh, Thailand as well, where um, not only part of where the ad was shown, but also how the weather was. If it was raining or not, a different type of product was advertised. So the, the shampoo, which is better for the hair when it's rainy, versus the shampoo, which is for the, the sunshine weather. So like this, you take context into, loca into account to make advertising even more relevant. Um, again, at specific locations, because at one part of Bangkok, it may be raining. In another area in Bangkok, it's not raining. Um, so by doing that, again, the higher relevance. On the big data side, um, we saw Earlier, I mean, in, in China is, uh, is Google not that strong, but in, in all the other um, regions. Um, this is my personal location history over one week in, in Singapore, actually. Uh, so you can see and assume I'm living in the city center. My office is also in the city center. Um, so and you can actually also go, go yourself um, to find it out. Um, if you go to google.com slash location history, um, then you can find out your own location history, as long as if you just enabled, of course, um, to find out up to 30 days backwards where you have been um, on as long as you've been using somewhere Google's um, infrastructure. So that's data points, um, user behavior. If you take that into account, you can build profiles way better and get, can get to the better personalized um, advertising. Now, because it's the last presentation, I'm making a little bit excursion towards some music um, and showing you some... Um, example of a campaign we've been also supported in Indonesia. Um, but then let me run this first. It's from Telkom Cell, and they have been just about six to eight months ago launched their 4G LTE network, and we are supporting that with location-based ads. But let me show you the, the video first. So what you see is basically one music piece which has uh, been produced at four locations um, 
four different locations, four different types of bands and musicians performing together, all connected via LTE. So where is the relevance to now location and context here in big data? Um, in order to get consumers to convert to 4G to upgrade their plans, um, we've done two things. One, in terms of the big data and the segmentation, um, we've been looking with Telkom set together at their subscribers who have LTE-enabled devices already but are not on a 4G plan, um, who have uh, or maybe a 3G device which uh, uh, needs an upgrade. So we've been targeting with different messages, different banners. Um, first of all, on that um, contextual information of the, um, sorry, in the big data analytics of are they capable already to get for the low hanging fruits first? Yeah, can they just simply upgrade to a 4G plan? Um, but then the uh, location context camp is in Indonesia is a large country and 4G is not available everywhere. So it's only a few areas uh, like Bali, um, Jakarta and, uh, and a few others. So I've been targeting only those metropolitan areas precisely where 4G is available in order to not frustrate the customer as well to advertise for a product which is at the end of the day not available in this area. So again, location and contextual information um, coming together um, to make a, a very efficient targeting and conversion then of users to 4G um, plans. Um, but it's not only that, it can go a step further, which is then retargeting, um, which means <coughs> once we have been exposing uh, the consumer to the ads with the specific meshes about LTE, we've been capturing their device information and then um, are able to do a retargeting, so which means you're going um, maybe back to a place where there is no 4G available, but still we can keep um, exposing the user to um, a message saying, back in Jakarta, back in the metropolitan where you've been, there is 4G available. So it's again reinforcing the, the advertising message and, and really make sure that uh, a conversion isn't happening. So retargeting also used um, heavily for, um, for the case in, in Telcomcell. Now, uh, where this now can, can bridge also towards um, smaller businesses um, and two senses. And, um, the first one I want to show is about um, sensors and beacons. Um, I think in the last two days you've heard a lot about beacons. Um, just want to make maybe sure and wrap up on, on that and show um, one case also how beacons can be used. Beacon by itself is, as you can see here, is one, one of the models. It's a quite small um, Bluetooth device um, which sends just an ID signal similar to a lighthouse out there. Um, so it's, it's in the first place just giving that ID information. And the phone through Bluetooth can pick it up and can uh, detect quite precise how far away are you from that beacon. 
And in the first place, Beacon technology has been developed to do indoor navigation, so that within a mall, within a supermarket, you know up to a two, three centimeter precise um, place actually where um, somebody is located, and can based on that not only send push message notifications, but also can interact with the consumer, um, can present him maybe a shopping list where the offer of the coffee, when you stand in front of the row with the coffee of, um, products, comes automatically up in your shopping app, for example. So possibilities to really um, interact with the consumer at a very precise location through, through the beacon. Um, now, beacons can be also um, used in, uh, of course, in retail environments here, like um, example from London. Um, the Regent Street has been beaconized, so to say. So the, uh, the retail association of Regent Street has equipped about 80 shops uh, along Regent Street with beacons. And the, the app um, coming with it then allows exactly those type of interactions when people walk by a certain store, um, they get reminded of um, special offers and promotions in, in that store environment. And this is something where you now the individual retailers of the, the street are taking advantage of driving additional footfall into their store locations. No, but it's not only about stores. Um, this is actually a quite nice one about dogs and beacons. use of beacon technology, but I think still a quite nice one to interact with a product. Um, Granata Pet Snack actually had done a, a previous campaign, not with beacon, but location-based, where they installed a similar food dispenser at billboard displays. Is real? Yeah, no, th this is real. This is a real campaign. Uh, it's running in Germany, or it's been run. Um, they have done billboards where there was a similar food dispenser at the billboards and if the, the dog master was checking in via Foursquare at that billboard, the food dispenser was uh, giving food away for, for the dog. And they had a measurable upsell in those areas of their um, products in the, in the supermarkets um, of that. So, uh, to show you that it's not only about display advertising, right? There's way more you can do um, around uh, location-based um, ideas and solutions. Um, but it's also, uh, there are some challenges with it. I mean, much of what I've been showing you um, it comes mainly from large uh, brand advertisers. Um, now, in order to overcome this, yeah, and in order to bring this also more to a um, local context and a small and medium business context, um, I wanted to show you actually something. Um, let's go here out of the presentation. and. here to um, a little demonstration of something we're, we're about to launch and which um, we would like to, to launch also together with, with Yellow Pages um, companies and, and similar um, aggregators, I would say, who have access to, to a lot of small businesses where now the display banner ads, what I showed before, right? those campaigns, usually this is five, ten, fifty thousand dollar campaigns run with a media agency and, and quite I mean, um, I won't not say complex work, but it's, it's quite a few steps and it's usually reserved to the large advertisers. But we are bringing this now to, to the small advertisers as well um, with a very simplified interface which now could work together um, with um, selling a listing, um, with selling um, 
time um, booking what we had um, shown before is similar thing. So like when selling to a small um, business, this could be a very easy way to run also um, <coughs> display ad campaigns. And this is, let me just show you a test campaign we put up here. Oops. In the mouse. Come back. Here we go. All right. So it's f four very easy steps to set up a campaign um, with the country, the category. Um, it's a CPM or a CPC model, so cost per thousand impressions or cost per click. Um, there's a fixed price then set for, uh, for a country. Basically, um, there's a pre-loaded budget, so the advertiser is either pre-approved and gets a budget um, through a contract which is in place already or can upload uh, and load own budget. Um, which then calculates a number of views or clicks um, for the campaign. Um, just says the start and the end time of the campaign, so that's uh, the basics. Um, second step is about the, the image, so which what is the display ad which is shown. Um, so very easy also to upload here um, a creative. Um, if there is no creative, we will offer a kind of creative builder that just with a simple logo. Um, you can actually then um, add uh, your ad content and number three is actually the most critical one. Um, that's now the locations. Um, so where these are locations in Berlin, um, where you see just set up very simple geofences for that. Um, so if I have a new outlet somewhere, let's say um, around Tegel Airport, I just add on an additional, oops, an additional geofence kind of put, uh, put it up here make it a bit bigger and I have an additional outlet there and to really um, run the campaign. Um, once I've set up all that, can additionally still decide if I want to target only specific devices. Uh, eventually we're going to add on here also like gender uh, and uh, some other um, possibilities to, to target. And then when it's about launching the campaign, then actually what hap what's happening here in the background and that's the interface is one thing, but um, really then um, the campaign is taken live and it's running on um, a number of, so you can see here also live data from the campaign, um, it's taken to um, DSPs, demand side platforms, where then the campaign is set up and run with very small, those small budgets and only those areas. Um, we've uh, implemented um, optimization algorithms so that uh, the click-through rate um, is monitored, um, that is optimized by the different apps it's shown, uh, so that really this campaign is, is running and uh, getting to the um, targeted impression rate or click rates um, for the advertiser, so that a small advertiser which has only a handful of outlets in a very easy way um, can set up and run additionally to search functionality, um, also display advertising targeted um, to them. So with that, um, I would like to, to round it up and uh, open up maybe to questions, or if there are no questions, then uh, let you end uh, the day here. <laughs> but thank you very much for your attention. Christian. Actually, I have one question that sort of, help, sort of addresses a number of the questions. Are beacons an interim technology, or are they a long-term solution? Midterm, I would say, um, for the, the reason. So, I mean, if you look at beacon deployments across um, the US and also here in, in Asia, so in the US, there are about a half a million beacons deployed today in, in retail environments, and that's only a start. Um, also, give an idea um, a mall like Iron Orchard in Singapore, so one of the flagship malls, you would need at least about 1,000 to 1,500 beacons for that one mall in order to be really. Um, pre precise and efficient. If you want to go very well, well, then you put up maybe three or four thousand beacons in a mall like that. Yeah. So that's a lot of beacons. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, now, having said that, in uh, I know of beacon deployments here in KL and in, in Jakarta, and then ten thousands or so beacons deployed already in first malls. So it's the technology which is, if you look at the hype cycle, it's definitely at, at that point where it starts now to to grow and be really implemented. Mm -hmm. Is it really? the technology for long term, um, I don't think so, um, because it uh, has also some limitations. It's battery powered, yep. unless you plug it into USB um, power, so there are beacons which can be USB powered, but the duration is between 6 to 12 months on, on a normal beacon. And there are new technologies coming up already which 
could replace a beacon. Um, magnetic fields, for example, um, they are first, uh, there's a company from Finland, they have an SDK for, for apps where now instead of having a beacon, um, you measure the magnetic field basically of the structure of the building and through that you do an almost as precise uh, location positioning uh, within a building than with a beacon. And with no little devices? No devices yeah. around, it's only, only then your phone. But you have to cartograph before the, the building then. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? All right, then I guess we're going to say thanks to Christian. Please join me in thanking Christian. Right. Oscar, Thank you, you want to join me up here? Thank you very much.